Should I go to my lavalier? What? It's on. Good. All right. Our gospel lesson for this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke, reading from chapter 9, verse 51 through verse 62. Listen now for the word of God. When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem, and he sent messengers ahead of him. On their way, they entered a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him, but they did not receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. When his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them. Then they went on to another village. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, Follow me. But he said, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, No one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. The Gospel of the Lord. It is great to be back with you here in this church. Um, unfortunately, in our small Presbyterian family, as word got around that there was a spare preacher, I started getting asked to preach at some other churches. So I haven't been able to be back here in a while. And uh, unfortunately for you, you get me this Sunday and next Sunday. So <laughs> we'll be really smooth by next week. Well, today I'd like to spend a little bit of time uh, talking about the first lesson that we read, the story in 2 Kings, about the generational transfer of power from Elijah to Elisha. Uh, it's been on my mind a lot this past week as we completed that first round of many, many more to come presidential debates. Debates are an introduction of someone to a national audience, an opportunity to begin to tell the story of your life and why that makes you qualified to take on the next challenge in your life's journey. And that is exactly where Elisha finds himself. Now, we read today from the end of the story. But it's interesting that the alternative lectionary reading also includes the beginning of the story, how Elisha was first called by Elijah. See, when Elijah met Elisha, he wasn't already out preaching the gospel. He was actually plowing a field with a huge number of 12 yoke of oxen out in front of him. And Elijah walks by him and simply throws his mantle over the top of him as if to say, come with me. But instead, Elisha says, can I at least go back and give my mom and dad a kiss? Elijah lets him. And Elisha goes back and kisses his parents, and then he slaughters his yoke of oxen and holds a feast for all of the people who worked for him before he leaves to follow Elijah. See, Elisha's not your classic prophet. He was rich. And this shows that Elisha has another problem. 
one that rarely garners any sympathy, but is particularly problematic in this kind of setting, and those are the presidential debates. It's what perennial presidential candidate Daniel Webster once lamented way back in the 19th century. Webster was one of the best qualified and most gifted speakers of his time, but he called it the log cabin problem, as in, I think I would have been elected president a long time ago if I had only been born in a log cabin. It's why last Thursday a powerful senator and former attorney general of the largest state in our country chose instead to evoke an image of a second grade schoolgirl struggling against segregation. Or our former vice president frequently prefers instead to emphasize his roots growing up in the blue collar town of Scranton, Pennsylvania. As if to say, take away from me your privilege. Share instead the story of your rise from rags to riches. This is an issue that's also vexed many Presbyterians for years. Burdened by our privilege, we long to present ourselves to the world as a little less white, less wealthy, less educated, less elite, perhaps more diverse, more salt of the earth. As our Book of Order puts it, we long to be possessed of a life of simplicity that shuns ostentation. Theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer was the same way. Despite his amazingly talented family full of doctors and musicians and intellectuals and overachievers, he struggled mightily, not with the ability to reach their levels of accomplishment, but the fact that he had not been born a poor outsider and how ill-equipped he thought that made him to represent the gospel. That's why I love the story of the prophet Elisha. The prophet for all of those well-meaning people who had the misfortune of being born into families with loving parents, supportive church environments, intellectual and artistic gifts, and forced to live under the guise of some false humility, shying away from boldness and destiny so as not to appear domineering or arrogant. Elisha might even be seen as the patron saint of educated university churches in the shadow of the state capitol. See, Elisha has a serious problem. He just doesn't seem like the prophet type, particularly since he has to follow Elijah, who Biblical scholar Walter Brueggemann once called that dusty, wandering prophet who lives outside the court of the king and answers to a very different authority. See, prophets are supposed to be the ones who eat locusts and wild honey and dress in rags and shout from street corners. Prophets rail against the powers and the principalities. They don't emerge from them. But Elisha's not that kind of prophet. He actually comes from an upper middle class family. He's got two parents who love him and whom he loves. He stands to inherit an impressive piece of property with plenty of livestock and fertile ground. So Elisha has a log cabin problem. How can he challenge the powers when he is one of them? Many years ago, when I made the decision to leave my father's law firm and enter a career in ministry, Central Florida Presbytery did what we always do when someone expresses an interest in ministry. They sent me off for a weekend of counseling. <laughs> And naturally, when I sat down with Dr. Sims at Eckerd College, I presented him with what I believed were all of my impressive credentials so that I could demonstrate to him that I was the best darn qualified candidate for ministry that he had ever seen. 
And then I sat back waiting for my gold star and his seal of approval. Instead, he did something surprising. He took out his Bible and he read to me the story of the rich young man. And then he turned to me and he said, John, I want you to notice that this story doesn't say that the rich young man gave up. It just says that he went away sadly because he had much to lose. So tomorrow, I want you to come back here and, and tell your story over to me once again. But this time, less of the great achievements and more of the failures and disappointments that you have experienced along the way. I did. And when I was done, he smiled at me and he said, you know, when you came in here, I wasn't sure what you were going to be giving up to respond to God's call, whether it was money or ambition or status. Now I know. It's none of those things. It is the fact that you're going to break your parents' hearts. He was right. And I, I think it was like that a little bit for Elisha, too. Notice that his one request before responding to God's call was that he be allowed to go back and kiss his parents before heading off on that journey. He knows he's going to break their hearts. He knows that despite all of the advantages that they have given him, he's going to be in need of a hefty second helping of God's grace. Because Elijah is a tough act to follow. Now, regardless of the journey that has taken you to this point in your life, like Elisha, I'm here to tell you that we can trust in the tenacity of God's Spirit to see us through, to overcome our failures and disappointments, to even use the gifts and privileges of upbringing, to challenge the very systems that gave us those advantages in the first place. A few years ago, I visited the Mariposa Sequoia Grove in Yosemite National Park, an amazing place. And I saw a really good example of that. One of the most famous trees in that grove is called the giant grizzly. It's this massive tree that would most likely have been the tallest tree in the grove, but for one particular irregularity. Somewhere along its journey from being just a tiny seed, its towering figure was stunted. And instead, they are these, there are these very long, seven-foot, outstretched branches on either side, almost like flexing biceps. And the ranger explained that that was the result of a bolt of lightning many, many years ago. And I thought to myself, wow, instead of this tree just saying to itself, bummer, of all the luck struck by lightning and curled up and shrank from its destiny, the tree instead channeled its growth and energy not into towering above all of the others, but by going in a new direction, stretching its arms out wide and expanding its base. That's a very powerful symbol for the church, where we're called to nurture and, and grow disciples. Those who might at times be hit by snags or face new circumstances in life, but by the power of the Holy Spirit, if we all simply channel our energy in new directions, we just might experience new areas of growth, expanding our base, embracing new members, sharing new stories. So when Elijah comes to Elisha and literally wraps that mantle tightly around him, Elisha steps off the plow and knows that he has been called. And yeah, I, I love that he wants to go home and, 
and kiss his mom and dad. <laughs> Whether that was because he, he wanted to get their permission to go or affirmation for his journey or, or simply to share how much he appreciated the important foundation that he had been given. He wanted to acknowledge the communion of saints that surrounded him before slaughtering his 12 yoke of oxen and throwing a great feast. Because Elisha was all in. He wants those he loves to celebrate with him. But just in case, at the end of our reading for today, he asks for a double portion, a second helping, if you will, of the Holy Spirit. Because he knows that the journey upon which he is about to embark will likely take him to places he never thought he would go and that he would be asked to do things that he never thought possible. And you know what else? That could be you or me. Fed at this table, surrounded by a church filled with mantle-wearing, parent-kissing, call-celebrating, wind-blown disciples like you and me. So whether you've come here today bursting with gratitude for a life filled with an abundance of blessings or weighed down by struggles with a life filled with regret, it's important to recognize that God will always bid you to take that next step, even without knowing where it might lead. So put on your mantle, come to the table, and journey on. Amen.